Debuting on Nintendo's Game Boy in 1996, Pokémon have captured the hearts and money of children worldwide for over 15 years now. A multimedia powerhouse, the franchise has spawned countless anime, movies, card games, manga, novelizations, and spin-off titles outside of the five generations of games in the main series. But what drives the seemingly simple games with their ever-present tagline of gotta catch them all to such heights of popularity year after year? And where do all those crazy creatures come from to begin with? As novel as the concept may have seemed to American children in the 90s, many of the cute little pocket monsters they could capture and play with would have been oddly familiar to the game's Japanese audience. The Pokemon franchise draws heavily on stories and iconography from traditional Japanese folklore and religion to create a robust world that is at once familiar, but just different enough to make it seem a bit more fun. This, along with addictive gameplay and masterful use of sheer cuteness, is what has allowed the series to remain relevant worldwide, even after many competing fads, such as Digimon and Yu-Gi-Oh! have died out. We'll be looking at four components that have contributed to Pokémon's continued popularity. By doing so, we'll learn a bit more about not just why the franchise is popular, but also tackle a few deeper questions about the world these monsters inhabit and just what it means to be a trainer to gods and monsters. It's hard to build a worldwide gaming phenomenon without solid gameplay to back it up, and the Pokémon series works hard to make sure it has something for everyone. The youngest players are attracted solely by the appeal of cute and the idea of playing with monsters. Older players, and those interested only in game mechanics, can spend hundreds of hours working to catch them all, using the same addictive formula that baseball cards, pogs, basically any other collection-based obsession triggers. It's the simple idea of creating a sort of addiction, a need to complete the ever-growing collection, that hooks gamers. While the series has often gotten flack for a lack of innovation, from the developer's point of view, I suppose you shouldn't try and fix what doesn't seem to be broken. You're just about the cutest little Pokemon I've ever seen! <gasps> Probably the first thing most people notice about Pokemon is that they are absolutely adorable. Anne Allison, in her article, Portable Monsters and Commodity Cuteness, Pokemon as Japan's New Global Power, says that cuteness involves emotional attachments to imaginary creation slash creatures with resonances to childhood and also Japanese traditional culture. That's a pretty wordy definition, but it calls out a few of the specifics that make Pokemon cute different from any other. First off, emotional attachment is a necessary component of the special brand of cute that Pokemon peddles. It's not enough for the little monsters to simply be cute. The player has to actually care. This artificial attachment is built in part by the game's constant admonitions that Pokemon are companions and should be cared for and about as friends. The series goes out of its way to make sure that its fans know that the trainers that capture Pokemon do so out of love, or at least the good ones do. What about this resonances to childhood bit? That's pretty self-explanatory, really. The series calls up that childhood idea that your pet could be your best friend, while the childlike look of the game world and its inhabitants fosters that playful childhood mentality. As for its connections with Japanese traditional culture, Pokemon pulls freely from familiar images and folklore to create its capturable fauna. Even a cursory look at the Pokemon roster will turn up some folklore doppelgangers for those familiar with traditional Japanese monster lore. Ninetales, the Firefox Pokemon sporting, you guessed it, Ninetales, is clearly a kitsune. Come on, Pokemon. You aren't even trying here. Things get a bit more creative when the Kappa get a turn. The originally grotesque reptilian gets much cuter in pocket monster form, although it's still easy to tell what creatures like Golduck here and Lotad are pulling from. A bit of the original mythology sneaks in here. The game entry in Pokemon Ruby for Lotad reads, Lotad lives in ponds and lakes, where they float on the surface. It grows weak if its broad leaf dies. Hmm, sounds familiar. 
Luckily, both Lotad and Gold Duck show very little interest in harvesting Chirikodama soul orbs. In some cases, rather than pulling from a specific tale, Pokémon take on characteristics of groups of folk creatures. Many of the ghost Pokémon, like Haunter, have the traditional Edo Ukiyo-e appearance of no feet and beckoning hands. Not all of the Pokémon are modeled on monsters. Darumaka bears the appearance of a Daruma doll, the small, red dolls created to represent Bodhidharma, the founder of Zen Buddhism. Even the strongest Pokémon isn't safe from this iconological borrowing. Although Arceus, the alleged creator Pokémon, is said to have shaped the universe with its 1,000 arms, its actual appearance is a white, deer-like creature with a ring around its middle. Deer feature in Japanese mythology as messengers of the kami. I guess Arceus prefers to hand-deliver his spirit mail. But deer, specifically white deer, also have a place in Japanese folklore, as in many others, as portents of good luck and discovery. One legend holds that following a white stag led to the discovery of Japan. Considering Arceus' coloration, as well as his place as the origin Pokémon, there's more than a slight chance that latter myth was the one the creators were calling on in creating his image. Now we're getting into the meat of things. Pokémon takes place in our world. Surprised? Each of the major game regions corresponds to a real-world location in Japan, or, for the most recent games, the U.S. The Kanto region is, well, the Kanto region of Japan. They got a little more creative after that. Johto is Kansai. The islands of Hoenn represent Kyushu. And the snowy mountains of the Sino region are equivalent to Hokkaido. The newest region, Unova, might feel a bit more familiar, as it's the good old USA. Specifically, the area around New York. The world also takes care not to be too different from ours. Although it doesn't seem like school is a big concern, if children can strike out alone to be the very best, for the most part in the Pokémon world, life goes on as usual. Familiar settings such as shopping centers, highways, power plants, even luxury cruisers, still exist and function the same way we're used to, although, of course, they're much more focused on the fuzzy inhabitants of the world. In some cases, the Pokémon even help to supply power or mine, and this too mirrors real-world concerns with sustainability. In Vermilion City, in Pokémon Red, players even have a chance to battle against Lieutenant Surge, the Lightning American, who the game tells us is a war veteran. Many players theorize that the war that Surge fought in was World War II, which would certainly go pretty far in explaining his presence in Japan, but it's never been confirmed. Regardless, little details like that establish that the Pokémon world follows a similar timeline to our own, with wars still being fought and Americans still setting up shop in Japan on occasion. Religion isn't left by the wayside either. Worship centers abound in the Pokémon world, both as small shrines that can be found in forests and mountains, to temples within cities, to the graveyards that game inhabitants visit to honor deceased Pokémon and humans both. Many of the pocket monsters are imported directly from Japanese folktales, while others are clearly adapted from them. These stories are familiar to the series' Japanese audience, the same way that Western fairy tales are familiar to us, much the same way that a film or book can be described as a Cinderella story, allowing us to instantly recognize that it will be a story about an underdog rising above their base circumstances. The Japanese children playing the games would need no exposition to know what Ninetales is really supposed to be. It's clearly a kitsune, in case you missed it. Much of the game world's history is hidden away in optional conversations, but for those that care to dig deep enough, the world of the games contains a deep mythology that imports and modifies real-world tales into a narrative that is at the same time both familiar and distinct. By going to such lengths to make a world that almost seems like it could happen, players are drawn into the fictional setting more smoothly than they would be if they were thrust into a completely alien landscape. Although much of the in-game folklore isn't presented blatantly, a full world, complete with creation myths, local legends, and fairy tales, exists for the plundering, if the player is curious enough to seek it out. Oftentimes, bulletin boards or townspeople will give up tidbits of lore regarding places of interest or legends about specific Pokémon if investigated. What you're seeing now is the awakening of a legendary, or essentially god-level Pokémon, named Giratina. 
Jaratna is a perfect example of hidden lore. Together with its companions, Dialga and Palkia, the three control time, space, and antimatter, and were created by Arceus, the white deer god Pokémon mentioned earlier, and used to create the world. While a great deal of that story is revealed through the normal course of the game, the player has to show a certain level of dedication to discover the full tale, and even more to meet the three. The companions, Dialga and Palkia, have an interesting connection to another famous creation duo, Izanami and Izanagi. According to the tale told in the Kojiki, Izanami and Izanagi descended from heaven and used a spear to stir the seas and create the islands of Japan and eventually the rest of the world. The Kojiki goes on to say that in the end, Izanami transferred her soul to a human and an animal before her death. The Pokemon games tie Dialga and Palkia to these two earlier deities and subtly hint that the animal that Izanami chose for her vessel is in fact Palkia, which would of course make the duo the ongoing forms of the Japanese creation duo. Digging up this history, and finding out both where it fits within the fictional world of the series, as well as making connections to real-world tales and happenings, is an addictive quality all of its own. Perhaps not as blatant or well-publicized as catching them all, understanding the world and where it both connects with and differs from our own is a major pull. Some connections are more blatant than others, such as when a Pokemon is clearly modeled on a figure from folklore. But in other cases, like the one with the creation trio, the player must show a certain initiative and dedication, being willing to dig around in game resources at the very least, to understand where and what the creatures are modeled on. More often than not, in cases where more digging is required, the reward is a rich mythology that serves to make the game world feel more real by tethering it more strongly to the stories we tell within our own. While playing Pick Out the Legend might be fun for the Japanese audience, what does being exposed to so much Japanese folklore, even if it is in a cutified form, mean for the franchise's Western consumers? After all, Pokemon is far from a local phenomenon. In Japan America, how Japanese pop culture has invaded the US, Roland Keltz writes that Pokemon gave America its first glimpse of what Japan could do if it was allowed to get to the children directly, without an interpreter and all of those lessons have been internalized. A whole lot of American kids now know a whole lot about Japanese folklore, whether they realize it or not. What does that mean for both them and the preservation and passing on of the source tales? Keltz goes on to say that the Pokemon phenomenon can serve as a Rosetta Stone for the Japanese anime industry. A critical translation device that unlocked for Americans and Europeans an entirely new language of entertainment. Of course, Celt's focus is mainly on consumerism and marketing, but the language of entertainment is a powerful one. Many of the children who started off addicted to gathering pocket monsters move on to a deeper interest in Japanese culture. And why shouldn't they? They grew up obsessing over it. The simple matter is, Japan's folklore, especially its monster folklore, has long been a source of common entertainment. As far back as the Edo period, professional writers and artists were creating so-called folk monsters for the delight of the public. Those monsters have now been moved into a higher echelon of status within the folk tradition by virtue of age, but the very traits that made them initially appealing have hung on. The kappa, kitsune, and always terrifying yurei have simply found another home in the Pokemon series. Much like the Pokémon themselves moved over to the Unova region, Japanese folklore has hopped off its island and captured the hearts of fans worldwide. Regardless of what gets changed around, queued it up, and translated, in the end, the Pokémon series is just one more way of keeping the legends alive.